All right, Second Timothy, chapter two or chapter one this morning or this <laughs> evening. Sorry, man, I'm off my game. It feels like I haven't been here in forever. Uh, I'm a little little out of order here, uh, yeah, in a bad way. But I looked at the I, ske- I looked at my schedule. I haven't I've only been here twice in the last four <laughs> weeks, so uh, it, it feels odd. Maybe three times, but uh, it's good to be here with you guys again. Uh, start a new book and. Uh, Let's get right into it here. Second Timothy chapter number one. The Bible reads in verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So right away, it starts out with a great phrase there, the promise of life. Now, of course, what he's referring to is the promise of eternal life, the life that uh, we are going to inherit in heaven, the life that we're going to have uh, with Christ. Um, you know, it wouldn't make any sense to say he's promising us to keep us alive here on earth, right? He's saying the promise of a life which is in Christ Jesus. So it starts right out with a great verse on eternal security. Uh, It is the promise of life that that is given us. So that shows us that, first of all, that God cannot break his promise. You know, God is somebody who, when he makes a promise, that's that's it. It's settled. And eternal life is one of those promises, as we see here, that we have the promise of eternal life. Now, of course, if you would turn to 1 John chapter 2, but that should probably also bring us to uh, remembrance, uh, bring us, uh, re- help us to remember another verse uh, in First in Titus chapter one, in another opening, uh, another greeting that Paul started to another uh, young preacher. He said, "In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began." So similar wording there, but uh, we see that that eternal life is the promise of God. It's not just something that we just kind of have that we we're, we we feel assured that we have just because. You know, the Bible says so. It's actually the very promise of God, that God has promised us eternal life. Uh, you're there in 1 John chapter 2, Luke, verse 23, 1 John 2, 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So again, eternal life is a, is a promise from God. So don't ever let anybody try to tell you different. There's a lot of people that will try to tell you that you, know, you could lose that eternal life, that, li- that uh, your position in heaven is something that could be lost. It could be something that could be taken away from you. Look at 1 John chapter 5. We'll see another uh, great one, this great promise. 1 John chapter 5, it says in verse 10, He that believeth on the Son hath a witness in himself, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he hath not believed the record that he gave of his Son. And this is the record that he gave unto, hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So God has given us eternal life, and how did he give it to us? He gave it to us in his Son, Amen. right? That's why we have the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. And he gave it to us, meaning it will never end. That's what eternal life is. It's not just the promise of life, but it's actually the promise of eternal life that we have uh, an everlasting life awaiting, awaiting us in heaven. Right. And, uh, <coughs> you know, it's never going to, it's never going to end. And of course, this ca- caused me to think of John chapter 10 as well, where it says in verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved shall, and shall go in and out and shall find pasture. The thief cometh not for, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So what is he saying when he says he wants us to have life more abundantly, is he saying that? You know, this mis, uh, this pe- some people misunderstand this to think that, you know, God wants you to have a bigger bank account, or you know, God wants you to have a bigger house, or God wants you to have more of the things in this life. But that's not what he said. He said he wanted them to have life and to have it more abundantly. So he wants us to have this life, the life that we have on this earth. You know, God wants us to live a long, full life and to serve Him and, and to and to be fruitful in this life. But he also wants us to have a more abundant life in heaven. You know, so if we have Christ, if we go in through that door, if we have it by him, then we're not only going to have this life, but we're going to have a more abundant life in heaven. So we have it more abundantly. We have the promise of life in Christ. So this, pri- we, of course, we all understand that this promise is received through faith in Christ. The Bible says there in verse 2, uh, uh, you know, or excuse me, in verse 1, that it is in Christ Jesus. Now it continues on here in verse 2. And of course, you know, we could preach a whole sermon on eternal life. And, you know, and it's probably something we all understand. It's probably all something that we are even good at explaining if we're going out soul winning. 
Um, you know, but here's the thing. It's, n it's something that we should never take for granted. It's something that we should always, you know, pause whenever we come across a, a verse like that that reminds us of the fact that we have the promise of life, of life eternal. That, I mean, that's such a precious promise that we have from God. It's something that we should stop and think about. Now, again, we could preach a whole sermon on it, but, you know, we've got a whole chapter to get through here, so we're going to move along from the subject. But it says there in 2 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, I'm going to struggle, I think, by the, you know, through these, the, I'm going to want to say first, you know, because we just did that. Probably by the time I get to the end of the book, I'll have it down, but... Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, or chapter 1, verse 2, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I love that he says there, my dearly beloved son. Because, you know, we, we start to see a little bit of the nature of the relationship that Paul had with Timothy here. These weren't just two guys that, you know, just kind of knew each other, that were loosely acquainted. These guys had a very real, very close, very... Uh, heartfelt relationship and you can read that in this language and really <coughs> this whole book especially this first chapter is just Paul kind of pleading with Timothy and we'll, we'll read later how Paul is saying you know he's coming to the end of his life you know he's finished his course he's kept the faith and he's ready to be to, to be offered you know the time of his departure is at hand and he's kind of handing off the mantle he's handing over the torch to Timothy and this book is him really just imploring Timothy to keep the faith to to fight the good fight of faith and, to, and to, to preach the whole counsel of God. So he's really just trying to implore him to continue on as a preacher. And uh, you get to see some of this come out in, you know, in, in the emotion here that, that's written. He says, my dearly beloved son. You know, he didn't just say, hey guy. You know, he, he uses some real strong language here. It's, it shows us the, the nature of the relationship. And what we see here is that it's of a father and of a son. Of course, spiritually speaking, we know that this wasn't his, Paul was not Timothy's earthly father. But it's in a spiritual sense, he's like a father to him. So if you would, <coughs> uh, go ahead and turn over to, uh, just go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So, again, we see this relationship here that it's kind of a father-son relationship. <coughs> in fact, he says in 1 Timothy uh one, if you remember in 1 Timothy 1, he, he says, unto my own son in the faith. So that's what it, he's referring to there when he calls him his son. He's saying, my son in the faith, right? And we know in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which were able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So he's calling him his son, not because of the fact that he's the one that got him saved. Because a lot of times, we'll look at it here in a minute, if you would turn over to Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, there are some people that, are Paul refers to as his children because he is actually the one that won them to the Lord. And that's kind of, you know, you can look at it that way. When you get someone to, uh, saved, you've begotten them, again, through, through the Spirit. You know, you've kind of, you, you've played a part in that, you know, in that new birth. You know, you brought the Word of God. Of course, we know it's all of God at the end of the day. It's His Spirit. Right. It's His Word that's doing uh, the work. But that's how, we'll see here in a minute, that's how Paul refers to some people that he's won to the Lord as his own children in the faith. And, you know, that's how we should look at the people that we get saved. You know, and now obviously, not ever, we're not going to develop a relationship like Paul had with, with Timothy with every person that we get saved. You know, Timothy had some other attributes about him that we'll see here that kind of allowed him to develop this relationship. Look at Acts chapter 16 and verse 1 where it says, Speaking of Paul, then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. So that's Timothy. And a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. So we find out right away who's Timothy's real father, that he was a Greek. And it says, which, and it says of Timothy in verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium, him would Paul have to go forth with him. And he took and circumcised him there because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So this is kind of the attribute that, you know, Timothy had here. And I think this... In Acts chapter 16, when we first meet Timothy, you know, we see something that's really important about Timothy's character and, and, and really shows us why it is that Timothy was allowed to be used of God so mightily. You know, obviously he got to become the right-hand man of Paul. He got to go ahead and be Paul's protege. He was one that, you know, got to, you know, just see all the mighty things that Paul did. He was there. He was a helper to him. But, what, but, but that, did, he just, did Paul just show up and pick somebody out and make him into that? There were some things that, that Timothy already had going for him when Paul found him. That's why it says there, uh, <coughs> that, uh, 
There was a certain disciple there named Timotheus, in verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra. Him would Paul to have to go with him. So when Paul was looking for this guy, when Paul was looking for somebody to train up to follow in his footsteps, he wasn't just looking for any, just anybody. He was looking for somebody that was well reported of by the brethren. So Timothy was a guy, he already had the right reputation. He was already in the church. He's already doing the work. He was already doing what needed to be done as a faithful servant. And, you know, he probably didn't go into that going, well, I know Paul's going to come through here one day. And boy, when he, gets, gets a, when he sees me and what I'm about, he's going to take me with him. I'm sure that wasn't his motivation at all. He probably just showed up just trying to go to church, do the right thing, serve God, just being faithful in what he was given to do. And this opportunity came before him. And, and then Paul came and said, hey, you, would you like to come with me? And, of course, he, he jumped on that, and, and, you know, the rest is history. But the point we're making here is that Timothy started out with, with, you know, doing the right thing, being faithful, and that's what led to him being able to develop this relationship with Paul. And Paul, refer, you know, we see again, Paul, I mean, this, he spent so much time with him and saw so many things and, and, and taught Timothy so many things in the faith that he refers to him as his own dearly beloved son. So <coughs> that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's where we could see in one sense that we can refer to somebody as a, a father or a son in the faith is when you have somebody who has taught you many things in the faith or someone who has helped you in your faith. Um, you know, that's probably not going to be just every other person that does that. But, uh, you know, there are certain relationships that we can develop within the church where certain people can come into our lives that we would look to them as a father or we would look to them as a son or a daughter, whatever it might be, in the faith. And uh, there's also, of course, as, we've, as I alluded to earlier, the sense of begetting somebody in salvation. There's the, you know, the, the spiritual uh, <coughs> relationship as a parent to a child when it comes to salvation. And if you would turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 15. Paul, writing to Corinthians, says in chapter 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, this is my son in the faith, or this is my child in the faith, in the sense that I've gotten them born again. I got them saved. I begot them again through the gospel. I mean, that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me, for this cause have I sent Timothy, unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So, that's great in 1 Corinthians 4, because we see both senses of that, of the, of the way you can refer to somebody as a child in the faith. He's saying here to the Corinthians, I have begotten you through the gospel, and then he's talking about Timothy, you know, I sent unto you Timothy, my, who is my beloved son. So in that one, those two verses, we get to see, you know, both senses of what it means to have a spiritual child or a spiritual father or parent in the faith. Now going back to First Timothy, uh, chapter or Second Timothy, sorry, Second Timothy, chapter one, verse three, it says, "I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day." So this is interesting to stop and think about what he's saying here. He says, I thank God. Now, what is he thanking God for? That I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. I mean, he's, he's thanking God that he remembers Timothy in his prayers. I mean, that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. That fact that, that we th would thank God that we even have somebody to pray for. You know? So that's just a thought that you know, kind of comes to mind when we read that. But it goes on in verse 4 and it says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother uh, Eunice. So if you're looking for some more baby names for girls, right? There you go, right? And I am persuaded that in thee also. Now, I like Lois. That's a good one. But uh, don't take that. I might, I might use that. <laughs> 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 Dibs. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so anyway. Um, but again, you start to see the language here that he, he, he has. These, you could see, get the sense of the, the, the feeling that he has for Timothy, the, the, the love that he has for him. He says, greatly desiring to see thee. You know, I, I don't know that we would say that about everybody in our life. You know? <laughs> Some people would be like, oh man, <laughs> here he comes again. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, that, that not everyone in our life where we're going to you know, have that longing to see them, greatly desiring to see them. I mean, he's missing him immensely. 
He, and he says, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. You know, he wants to see him so that he can be filled with joy. And, and why is that? Because he recalls to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in him. So <clears throat> it says there that he wanted to see him so that he could be filled with joy when he calls to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in him. So Paul's knowledge of Timothy, he knew that Timothy was the real deal. He knew this about Timothy, that he was authentic, he was genuine, you know, he was loyal, he was faithful. He knew that about Timothy. And that, his, that knowledge that he had about Timothy, we see here, was a source of joy for Paul. He knew that about Timothy. He said, this guy's the real deal, and it brought Paul joy. That's what it says there. Greatly desiring to see thee, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Man, I know you're the real deal. I want to see you, you know, and you bring joy to me because I know you have unfeigned faith. It was a source of joy for Paul. It caused him to long to want to see him. Now, if you would, turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. This is something that, you know, uh, we should all take note of. Because of the fact that our faithfulness to the Lord could be a source of joy to another believer in Christ. Maybe not even, you know, a, a spiritual elder, but just another brother in Christ, another sister in Christ. Look here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So Paul's talking about how he's going through all these afflictions. The Jews were persecuting him, if you read the context of this chapter. And he says that we were comforted by your faith. Verse, uh, verse 8, and he said, For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Paul's you know, saying, hey, no matter what happens to us, if ye stand fast in the Lord, we live. And he's saying you know, that their faithfulness to the Lord was something that caused him to continue to push through those afflictions that he suffered. He was doing it for them because they were, uh, you know, they were real. They had their, their faith. He said in verse 9, For what thanks can we render unto God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So again, some of the same language that he was talking about with Timothy, he wanted to see these people. He wanted to perfect that which is lacking in their faith. And he said, look, we live because ye stand. And what was it that, that, that caused all that? It was because that they were comforted because of their faith. So our faith, our faithfulness, our loyalty is something that can bring great joy to another person. You know, some people, uh, you know, could uh, just be a great, like be a, a, be a Timothy to somebody. You know, whether it's a man of God, whether it's another brother and sister in the church, you know, that's why it's important to be faithful to the Lord. You know, other people are watching. And it's not just so people, so you can, you know, not mess things up, but it's also because, you uh, you know, your walk, your faithfulness could end up being a real inspiration to somebody else. You know, when somebody else sees you go through a hard time, when somebody else sees you suffer, go through affliction and, and, and endure that and stay faithful to the Lord, you know, that could be what gets them through their affliction. That could be what gets them through their trial when they face that same thing. So go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 since you're right there. Because we have to remember, and especially... You know, and especially for a, a man, you have to remember Paul was a man who was, I mean, his life was the ministry. I mean, he was investing in these people. He was preaching to these people. He was, he was building them up in the faith. He was winning the Lord. He was establishing the churches. So, I mean, he's invested in these people. And as a result, he was able, probably, he was able to get a lot of joy out of seeing them remain faithful and live for the Lord. That brought him, that was a great source of joy. I mean, that was his life's work. You know, he, he was in it. Now look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. He said, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we uh, would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, for ye are our glory and joy. So what this is showing us is that our faithfulness is a joy to those who have invested in us. You know, our faithfulness, our unfeigned faith is a, is a great source of joy. It's a crown of rejoicing. It's hope to those that have invested in us. You know, Paul here is somebody who invested in the Thessalonians. And he had been there. He wanted to get back and see them again. He wanted to build up their faith. He wanted to perfect that which is lacking. 
But he knew what, you know, when he had sent Timothy unto them, he knew, got that report back, what, that they were, you know, staying in the faith, that they're remaining faithful. And he's saying, look, that caused us to live. We found out ye stand, we live. And he says, you guys are our hope. You guys are our joy, our crown of rejoicing at the, in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming. So <clears throat> that shows us, first of all, that our faithfulness can be a great joy to those that have invested in us. I mean, you know, I think of my own self. You know, I've, I've, I've had men of God invest in me, you know, just through, you know, not even directly one-on-one, -on -one, but just by them, you know, being faithful themselves and preaching the word of God to me, you know, three times a week and, and, and in some instances taking me aside and showing me things or helping me in some area. You know, they've invested in me. They've invested in my spiritual life. They've helped me to grow as a Christian. Now, what if I were to just say, well, nuts to all that and just cast that off and just say, well, I'm just going back to the world. You know, what if I just turn into a Demas and decide, well, I'm just going to go back and live the world, you know. This whole deacon thing's just not for me, you know. That would be a great disappointment to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, my, my pastor would probably, our pastor would probably be a little distraught about that. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he'd get over it and move on, you know. <laughs> but if that would be a source of, that, would that be a crown of rejoicing before the Lord? No, that would be a source of disappointment. You know, and that goes for all of us. You know, any, anytime we have people that are investing in us and trying to help us, you know, we, we have to understand that when we walk away, if we walk away from that, that's a, that's a great source of disappointment to some people, especially those who are putting the time in to help others grow. So what we can see from this is that we can be a source of joy to those that have invested in us, or we can be a great source of disappointment. Right? <clears throat> That's why it says, I'll read to you, and if you could, you could just go back to uh, 2 Timothy. It says in Hebrews 13, obey, obey them which have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. So he's saying, look, the, guy, the people that are, 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 are uh, watching over you or watching for your souls or teaching you the word of God, and, and, and they are going to give an account, you know, and they, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. You know, that's, that's what we want. We want our pastor to say, the people in Tucson, you know, they, he wants to give that account right. when, he, when he goes before the Lord, account of joy. You know, each one of us individually. That so-and-so, you know, was faithful. That so-and-so, you know, did the work that he was given to do. And not with grief. And it goes on and says, of course, for that is unprofitable for you. You know, at the end of the day, if we just cast all these things off, and just say, forget it, you know, uh, and, and just and, and forsake the assembly and forsake the Christian life. You know, we'll still be saved. We have the promise of life. But are we going to be a crown of rejoicing? Are we going to are we going to be a source of of joy or of grief? And at the end of the day, we have to understand it says that it is unprofitable for you. You know, <coughs> the, the people that have invested in us, they're still going to profit from their own their own walk in Christ, right. from the other things that they have accomplished in life. We're going to be the ones that suffer. You know, and I've seen that a lot. I've seen people who, who leave church, who quit church, they get mad, they, they, whatever. They just quit on God. And you know what? They, and and, and even, I've even seen people get thrown out and then and say things like, you know, well, faithful word's going to come to an end. You know, God's going to judge that place. And then years go by, and they're the ones that are suffering. They're the ones that aren't profiting. Faithful work continues to thrive and grow and carry on. So remember that if we ever, if we ever decide that we're going to quit on God, it's that we're only hurting ourselves as far as profiting in the Lord. Now I will say you, will, you very well may be a source of disappointment or joy to those that have invested in you. So <coughs> he says here in, four, in verse 6 of 2 Timothy 1, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. So again, here he is telling him this is kind of the thrust of the letter where he's trying to just really get Timothy to continue on in the things that he has taught him. That he would continue to be a preacher, that he would stand boldly for the word of God. And he's telling him, I put thee in remembrance. You know, and I've talked about this in other sermons, but this is something we always have to keep in mind, is that being told the same things over and over. I'm not saying that we should turn into a broken record up here, but we always have to be, because we're forget we are forgetful by nature. And we need to be constantly ha being putting ourselves in remembrance of things. Right. And he's trying to put him in remembrance of something specifically that he would stir up the gift of God. 
that is in thee, which is putting uh, by the putting on of my hand, uh, uh, by the putting on of my hands. Now he's probably referring to the fact that gift being the unction of the Holy Spirit that he received by be having a man of God ordain him into the ministry. So <coughs> the other thing I kind of want to point out here is that, and I heard a preacher preach on this recently, and I thought this is a really good point, is that being ordained is a gift. Okay, that's what it says there. Rem put, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. So the gift of God, you know, receiving that unction through the ordination is a gift. Right, it's something, now do you work for a gift? No. No, you don't. Now, do, are there things that you have to do in order to go into the ministry? Are there certain qualifications you have to meet? Yes. Yeah. But th what that tells us is that, you know, qualifications are just not, in, they're, they're, they're a checklist, yes, but they're, and they're goals, yes, but accomplishing those things, that doesn't mean, that's not a guarantee of going into the ministry. That, that is something that ultimately, at the end of the day, God gives. That God just determines whether or not, what did Paul say? Uh, I thank God who, that counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. He thanked Christ Jesus the Lord who, th who counted him faithful putting him in the ministry. He didn't say man put him in the ministry. You know, man did put him in the ministry when, they, when they tr the, the apostles you know, put their hands and, and separated Paul and Barnabas under the work that the Holy Spirit had given them to do. We know that man played a part in that, but ultimately it was of God. God was the one who put him into the ministry. So yes, we do everything on our part to meet these qualifications. We have to understand at the end of the day that being ordained is the gift of God. That going into ministry is something that God determines. So ordination is definitely earned, right? We go through, we try to make the qualifications, we show ourselves faithful, we, we, we do all those things that are required of us. But it's earned, but that's not to say that it's deserved. You know, we can't just say, you know, say well, I did everything that's here. I, I crossed all the T's and I dotted all the I's. And you may have, but that doesn't guarantee anything, you know? You still have to, uh, it ultimately has to be of God that puts you in there. You know, and he, uh, he would obviously be the one leading the man of God. But, you know, and this is kind of, this was kind of timely for me because I've kind of, I've had people even recently, you know, just even just last night, someone approached me and said, hey, are you starting a church in this town or this town? They wanted to know if I was going to go back to Michigan and start a church. I said, I don't have any plans to doing that. You know, I've been asked from time to time, you know, are you going to, are you going to pastor? Are you going to start a church? And, uh, you know, I've, uh, now I have, a, I used to just say, well, you know, we'll see what happens, let God lead. But now I have, this is my answer to, to, to those that would inquire, to those that would ask of me. I would say, um, you know, it's not my decision to make. You know, if God leads, you know, if God says, well, you're just going to be the deacon. For, you know, and I shouldn't say it like that, just the deacon. But I'm saying, you know, you're not going to go into the pastorate. You're going to remain the deacon. You know, so be it. You know, I'm fine with that. You know, I, I kind of like it that way, actually. <laughs> But you know, if it, that's that's the you know that's what I get out of this verse is that it's the gift of God. Yes, we work. Yes, we try to meet these qualifications. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's God's gift. That going so you know going into the pastorate not my decision to make. Now I can disqualify myself, or I can you know strive to attain that. But at the end of the day, it's not my decision to make. That's what I answer now. Are you going to be a pastor someday? It's not up to me. You know, it's up to God. It's up to my pastor. You know, to, you know, those that have used the office of a deacon well purchase themselves a good degree. So let's, you know, I'm focused on that. Let's just use this office well and, and we'll, we'll worry about what comes next. But uh, he goes on in verse 7 and he kind of explains why he wants him to stir up the gift of God. He says, you know, he puts him in remembrance. He says, thou, thou stir up the gift of God. Verse 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So he's saying, what's he saying? You're saying, look, you need to stir it up and don't be afraid to preach what needs to be preached, the way it needs to be preached. That's Because remember, that's, that's the gift that he wants him to stir up, this gift of prophecy, this gift of, of preaching, this gift of the ordination that's being given as a, as a pastor. And he's saying, don't remember that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so he's trying, telling him to not be afraid to preach what needs to be preached. Now you would say, a lot of us we might read that and say, well, of course Timothy wasn't afraid. You know, what man, of, you know, what, what, what was he, why does Paul have to remind him that? Well, you know, it's, we're all human. You know, uh, it's, it'd be perfectly natur natural for a, for a preacher to, you know, perhaps sh want to shy away from preaching certain things in the Word of God. I mean, does that happen? All the time. 
we see, we see men of God, you know, good men, ordained, put there by God, but when it gets to a certain passage, they just flip the page. When it comes to a certain topic, oh, we just don't want to talk about that. You know, uh, you know, I, well, I'm even you, now, of course, our mind always turns to the, to those, those real controversial subjects. We, you know, you know, Leviticus 2013. Well, let's just not preach that. You know, let's not preach on the homos. You know, let's not preach on Romans 1. Let's not talk about it. Let's just ignore it. Why? Because they're afraid. Because they're afraid of the backlash that will come. That's why you have I idiots like Charles La Lawson stand up, or Larson, or whatever it is, get up and say, "Oh, the homos are welcome here." You know, guy's got a voice. Uh, he's got a voice for radio and a face for it too. But you know, he, he the, he'll roll out the red carpet for him. Right. You know why he's not? He's not trying to sound like a loving kind. It's because he's afraid of them. Yeah. He's afraid of the backlash. You know, because he sees what happens to men that stand up and take a bold stand and stand on the word of God. You know, men like Pastor Grayson Fritz out there mm -hmm. in, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. That man stood up, preached the word of God, and stood on the word of God, and persecution came. And you know what? There's probably a lot of other pastors that saw that and said, well, I'll make sure I'll never do that. Right. Boy, I better make sure I never say anything like that. I'd hate to have to go through that. hate to have my face on national news. And I'd hate to be like Pastor Roger Jimenez and, you know, have, go international for preaching something out of the word of God. They shy away from that, you know, and that's why t Paul here is saying, look, God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given a power and of love and a sound mind. You know, people who are going to get up and preach, they need to preach the whole counsel of God. And they need to preach it with power and they need to do it with a sound mind, knowing that they're right. You know, have a sound mind about it, knowing that these things are true. And if that's what it says, you know, the world can like it or lump it. This is what the Bible says to preach it with power, to preach it with authority and, and let the chips fall where they may. He goes on and says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. You know, he's saying, you know, don't be afraid. Preach the word of God. He's saying, and don't be ashamed of the Lord, of his testimony. And don't, also, don't be ashamed of me, Timothy. <coughs> me, his prisoner. You know, Paul was in, was in prison. You know, and people would be like, oh you're, oh, you're with Paul? Well, yeah. Oh, you go to faithful word? No, yeah. yeah. You know, that because the church is like this, they develop a reputation in their community as being that church, you know, and not in a good way with certain people. You know, other, I mean, we do have a good reputation in other ways, I'm sure, you know, or we, or we will. People go, oh, that's that church that goes soul winning. That's a church where they preach the whole word of God. That's where they, you know, that's where they, they just let the, they just, they just preach the whole thing. And we'll have a good reputation. But with some, there would be some that would say, oh, I can't believe you go to that church. You know, we experience this, that, some of us, a lot of times with our family. You know, oh, that's your preacher? Mm -hmm. I remember when, when that whole thing went down with AIDS, the AIDS-free Christmas, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when Pastor rolled out his, his solution to <laughs> cure the world of the HIV through means of Leviticus 2013, that if we would just execute all homos as, as the Bible says the government should, Amen. that we would have an AIDS-free world. It's truth to that. Right? But when that happened, you know, that caused quite a uproar. You know, they didn't like that. <laughs> they went viral. There were protesters. There were Facebook groups made, you know, of people that were going to go out and gather and, and, and write up, you know, vulgar signs and, and cars were going to drive by and honk. And it was just, it was crazy. But you know what? I, I mean, I had, I had a family member that, because I, I got on the Facebook group of the protesters because I want to see who was coming. We all, we all joined the group, like, like we got like 300 people in this group, like half of them are faithful word, you know, <laughs> and just like checking things out, you know, and uh, they're like, you know, and, and, and it showed up my feed that I was, I was going to this event, and I had, a, I had a family member, it was a sister text me, hey, is that your, are you going to that event to protest that pastor? I texted back, that is my pastor, and that conversation came to an end, and that was the last time we spoke. You know, so, but here's the thing. I could have said, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm kind of, yeah, I am going to that event. <laughs> yeah, right. But I'm just not going to tell you which side of the picket line I'm going to be on. Because I'm ashamed of my pastor. I'm ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. And I'm ashamed of the man of God. People do that. People draw back. The protesters show up. The cameras show up. Well, I'm going to stay at home today. I'm going to catch the live stream. You know, I don't want, you know, I don't want anyone to know I go there. You know, that kind of thing happens.
And that's why Paul here is even reminding a man like Timothy. So we better not think that we're not capable of this as well, to falling into this trap. Paul has to take the time to remind Timothy to, hey, don't be afraid. Preach the word of God, you know, in power and in love and a sound mind. And don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of this book. Amen. You, know, and, you know, don't be ashamed of the words of our Lord in this adulterous and perverse generation. You know, they're, they're the ones that ought to be ashamed of, of, of the fact that they don't line up with this. And not us. So don't be ashamed of the word of God. Don't be ashamed of the testimony. And, you know, it's a pitfall for all of us, but it's a pitfall that preachers can fall into, especially. That's why he's really kind of driving it home here, I think, with him. And he's pleading with him to continue to follow in his footsteps. Now, I should have had you keep something in Acts, but if you would, go back to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> you know, Paul in this book, he's pleading with Timothy to follow in his footsteps, to do what he has done. To, to, to follow the example that Paul has set. And Paul shows us the kind of man, the kind of preacher that he was here in Acts chapter 20. Look at verse 17. And, it's from, and it says, uh, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, and when they were come to him, he said to them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in the weight of the Jews. He's saying, Look, you know what kind of trials and tribulations I had to go through. You know what kind of opposition I faced. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you both, and, and, but have showed you and taught you uh, publicly and from house to house. He's saying, look, you know that I haven't held anything back from you. That I have, I have, I have not held anything back from the word of God, and I've taught it publicly. And that's the kind of preacher that Paul was. And that's the kind of preacher that Paul wants Timothy to be. And that's how we should all be in the Lord. There shouldn't be anything in the Word of God that we're ashamed of, that we're not, that we're not willing to just stand up and cry from the housetops. You know, and also, you know, that, that's easy to say, but, you know, sometimes, especially when we're newer to the faith, there might be a little bit of an adjustment to that. Because some of these things come as a shock. When you first start to hear a preacher actually get up and preach the whole counsel of God. You might think you're ready for that because you've been watching it on YouTube. You know, but when you actually get there in the flesh and you actually start to hear it, you know, I remember when I first showed up at Faithful Word and the first time I heard fag come across the pulpit, <laughs> you know, I was like, can he say that? <laughs> you know, is that the first time I ever heard him say fag from the pulpit? No, I heard it many times. You know, get up and rip on the homos. I mean, it, it, there was part of the flesh that was like, well, you know, just slip out the back here, you know. <laughs> That's not the case anymore. I mean, I'll, I'll say fag from the pulpit is the same as anybody. But, you know, the thing is, that could be something that we have to kind of grow into. To learn, you know, when we feel, like, ashamed of that. To remind ourselves, to stir up the gift again that is in us. And to remind ourselves, we ought not be ashamed Amen. of what the Bible says. Amen. We should not be ashamed of what the preacher is preaching. And if we are, we are the ones that need to get right. This does not need to get right. You know, we need to, we need to keep that in mind. Go ahead and turn back to Acts, or not Acts, excuse me, 2 Timothy. So again, he's imploring him to continue in his footsteps, to uh, stir up the gift of God, to, to, remember, to not be ashamed of the testimony, but to be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He's saying, look, preach the whole word no matter what happens. Be a partaker of, of the afflictions according to the power of God. And he says in verse 9, who hath, who hath saved us and called us with a holy call calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was uh, given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. Now, I'm going to talk about that uh, coming up on Sunday because that's part of the, that sermon, so I'm not going to focus in on that too much. But it says in verse 10, But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our so uh, Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath given life and immortality to light through the gospel. So he's, he's saying, you know, He's imploring him, and then he's kind of reminding us, he's reminding Timothy of the motivation. Why is it that you should stand? Why is it you should not be ashamed? Why is it that you should stir up the gift? Because of who it is that you're serving. You know, you're serving somebody who has saved us, not according to our own works, right? You know, we don't deserve the salvation that we have. Before we ever want to draw back from God and be ashamed of his word, let's not forget the fact that he saved us in spite of ourselves. 
and that you know we there is a debt of gratitude that we owe <laughs> at least there ought to be you know if we fully understand everything that christ done for us why would we ever be ashamed of his word i mean if it was good enough for us when we got saved well what's wrong with the rest of it you know we don't deserve the salvation we had you know i mean it was, he says it was before the world began it was it was promised us in christ jesus it was given us in christ jesus before the world began you know, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord because you're serving the true and living God. Amen. This is your motivation. It's why you ought to uh, continue to uh, not be ashamed and to, and to stir up the gift that is in you because you're serving the God that was there before the world began. We're serving the true and living God. You know, it's really, it would be a lot different if we, you know, we were serving some false God. Now, people turn their back on their false idols all the time. I mean, I knocked on a door yesterday out souling, and I said to a guy, I said, hey, are you, uh, are you a Christian? Oh, I'm Catholic. I'm Roman Catholic, he said. I said, well, hey, more important where you go to church, you know, if you were to die today, you're 100% sure you go to heaven. Oh, I don't know. There's like 63 religions out there. I don't know which one of them are right. I don't want to talk about it. There's actually only seven major world religions, but I had to point that out. I was like, you could probably name more cereals than you can religions, but, you know, thinking in my head. The point I'm trying to make is that guy, you know, he didn't, he didn't serve the true and living God. You know, and look how quickly, yeah, I'm Catholic, but, you know, whatever. Right. Maybe tomorrow I'll be a Hindu. Maybe tomorrow I'll be a Buddhist. It doesn't really matter. Right. That's not the case with us. Amen. Because we know that we serve the, the, the true and living God who was before the world began. Right. And, uh, you know, he has abolished death. We're serving a powerful God, you know, who abolished death, who rose again from the grave. How do I know all those other religions aren't right? Because those guys are all in the grave. Buddha's in the grave, Muhammad's in the grave, Joseph Smith's in the grave, they're all in the grave. But there's no grave that's got the, the bones of our Savior in it. Right. You know, he's in heaven. So that's why, that's the motivation, I believe, that he's showing us here. He's showing us that, you know, why is it you shouldn't be ashamed? Why is it that you should, you know, preach the word of God and stir up the gift, Timothy? It's because of the God that you're serving. You know, he's trying to remind him. He says in verse 11, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for which cause I also suffer these things. He's saying, you know what? I suffer these things for the same reason you should. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know, why, you know, if you really knew who you were serving, if you really understood who God is, you know, if these preachers really understood who God is and really were close to God and, and were full of the Holy Ghost like they should be, they would not be ashamed to preach the whole counsel of God. If they feared God more than they feared men. I mean, are you more afraid of some, you know, some person that, you know, some news person's just going to put you on a, a, a 15 minute, probably not even that, like a 5 to 10 minute newscast? on the evening news for saying something controversial, that's, that's who they're more afraid of than the God who was there from the world began, before the world began, who abolished death. You're more afraid of them than him. They're more afraid of, of you know, being on, on the, some newspaper or on some major network than they are of God. And then here's the thing. Those people, you know, they're all going to forget about, you know, you go viral, it's going to go on for a while, but you know what they forget? The protesters quit showing up. They move on to the next big story. And if they, you, know, you do it enough and you stand strong enough, they figure out, well, it's just a waste of time to even go there. We're just giving this guy more publicity than, than we want to anyway. But they're more afraid of those people than they are of God. And he's saying, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. He's like, I'm not ashamed. And it's not just because God gives him this great assurance. It's probably a lot of it has to do with the fact that he knows that if he is ashamed, he's going to have to give an account that God will deal more harshly with him than, than anybody on earth ever could, that there, you know, there would probably be a chastening. That if, you, if, a, if a preacher knows to do right, therefore the, him, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right. I know I should preach this. I know this is what the Bible says. I know this is a major problem in our society today that I need, should be preached against, but I'm not going to. Well, you know what? You're going to give an account, buddy. You know, someone's gonna, you're, God's going to hold your feet to the fire on that one. You're going to suffer loss for that. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell or anything like that. We all understand that. But there's going to be chastening. There, God's going to deal with that. D definitely don't expect God's blessing on it. But he's saying, look, I suffer these things because I am, and I am not ashamed, for I know whom I've believed. I believe the God of the Bible. <clears throat> I 
Paul was willing to suffer because he understood who he was serving. And what he's doing here in this book is, is he's reminding Timothy of the same thing. So he says in verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words. You know, get a grip on this and don't let go. Hold fast the form of sound words, <coughs> which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. <coughs> So he's imploring him to be faithful. He's telling him, look, I want you to be faithful. And what is it that's going to make him faithful? What is it that's going to help any of us to be faithful? To stay faithful in the Lord. To be a crown of rejoicing. So that those that have invested us can do so with, with joy and not with, with shame. What is it that's going to cause us to remain faithful? Well, it says there the form of sound words. We need to hold fast the form of sound words. That's the first thing we need to do. You know, we need the Bible. If we're going to be the Christians that we need to be for God and for those around us, we need to hold fast the form of sound words. We need to be in this book. Amen. Reading it, living it, knowing it, understanding it. I'm not saying we all have to become experts in it overnight. But we should be faithfully reading it, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and growing through it. We need to hold fast and not let it slip. He says, hold fast the form of sound words. If you do that, that's going to help you remain to be, help you to be a faithful person. <clears throat> which thou hast heard of me, he says. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. You know what? We need preaching. Preaching helps. I mean, you know, I, I, we, I've heard Pastor Anderson say it, and it's true, and I'll, I'll repeat the same thing here. There's nothing you can't learn on your own. That you, there's nothing here that can be taught from this pulpit that you can't learn on your own from your own Bible reading. Nothing. But what it does is accelerates your growth. It teaches you things quicker, you know, because we're all even even the preachers that get up and preach. We're just preaching the things that we were taught by other preachers, right. and they just taught the things that they were taught by other preachers, and we're just standing on the shoulders of those that have gone before us and repeating these same truths, yeah. rather than just having to figure it out all in ourselves. Why not come together, collectively, and all be taught the same, and taught these things, and grow at a quicker rate? So we need to hold fast the form of sound words and those also which has thou hast heard of me, of the preacher. You know, the, the, the preaching is what we need. That's going to help us to be a faithful person because we're going to learn these important truths. Why is it that we should be faithful? Why is it that we should not be ashamed? It's from the things that we learned in preaching. And he goes on and says uh, that that good thing which was kept it, uh, committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost. You know, you can read all your Bible reading and you can be faithful to all the services and get all the preaching in. But at the end of the day, you're going to need God's help to help you remain to be a faithful person. You know, your Bible reading and the preaching of the Word of God, that's going to take you so far. At the end of the day, there's going to be certain times and situations and temptations that come into your life only God's going to be able to help you with. And you're going to need the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. You have to keep these things by the Holy Ghost. So that means you know, you're going to have to live a life that the Holy Ghost can bless. You know, we have to live a separated life. We have to work on getting the sin out. We have to, you know, not quench the spirit. That you know, and we, we and, and and to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, so that you know that we do the things that we ought to do. <clears throat> now he goes on here. We'll wrap it up here in verse fifteen. He says, "This thou knowest that they which are in Asia be turned away from me." So even in Paul's day, even a preacher as powerful as Paul had people turning his back on him at people being unfaithful. So even it happened then. So again, we should take heed to these things. I and mean, that's really what this chapter is about, trying to remind us again of why we ought to be faithful to the man of God, why we ought to be faithful to church, why we ought to be faithful to God, why we ought to be faithful to Bible reading, to preaching, to all of these things, and to not be ashamed. Because even somebody as powerful a preacher as Paul can have people turn on him. Of whom are Phile uh, Philegius and Hermogenes, Paul, that wasn't very nice to name the names, you know, but Paul named the names, didn't he? And when it's appropriate, names ought to be named, you know. And he said, uh, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he hath oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he is in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. So this guy obviously had a real burden for Paul. You know, when, when Paul was in there, he, it says he was not ashamed of his chain, meaning, you know, when he was. You know, when he was in, in, in captivity, you know, when he was under arrest, he was able to, he sought him out. 
He was not ashamed of his, his, his chain, but he was sought him out very diligently. You know, back then you have to think about it. It wasn't probably a little bit harder to find somebody. You could just, you know, text him, hey, send me your location, <laughs> you know, and, and just be like, oh, I'm over here, you know, and just go find him. You had to like, hey, have you seen Paul? Who? You know, the guy, you just had this look, little Jew guy. <laughs> you know, I don't know what Paul looked like, but people say he was short. He's obviously a Jew, right? So he's, he's looking for this guy, describing him. It probably took a lot of work. Probably wasn't just a matter of one day. He t sought him out very diligently and found me, you know? If we're serious about looking for the truth and looking for somebody or, or that's going to help us or looking for help, we're going to find it. Right. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me in Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So this guy, and I hope I'm saying his name right because he's a really good guy here apparently, Anisiphorus, you know, he goes down in history in, the, in this book as a really good guy. So it shows us, you know, but here he's not the only guy that's mentioned in this passage, is he? There's other guys, Philegius and Hermogenes. So what this is showing us is that our testimony, for better or worse, does not go unnoticed. You know, it's not that we just get to live however we want and no one pays attention. You know, we develop a reputation. We could either end up like Phygelus or Anisiphorus, right? And we all know that, that even Jesus, you know, Jesus is going to come. He said, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So, we should be concerned about how we're behaving ourselves, how we're treating the man of God, how we're, uh, whether or not we're being faithful. You know, are we going to be more of a phile uh, a, phi uh, a phylegious or are we going to be more like an Anisiphorus? You know, we, are, we, are we hindering the work of God or are we helping the work of God? You know, what's our reward going to be? We're going we're gonna to Jesus is going to give to every man according as his work shall be or not be. Maybe there won't be anything to receive. <coughs> And here's the thing about it. If you would, just go to Daniel chapter 12. We'll close there. Daniel chapter 12. I know it's kind of, kind of out there passage to turn to at the very end, but <clears throat> here's what I want us to understand is that we will realize just how much we missed out on, but then it'll be too late. When you realize just how much you missed out on, because here's the thing, we're all going to miss out on things. We, tr we strive and we work to receive a full reward, but there, there's just no doubt about it. You know, we, we were all, we're all gonna, we all have feet of clay. We're all sinners. We're all going to mess up. There's going to be things that we drop the ball on and we miss out on rewards. But none of us are going to realize just how much we've each individually missed out on until it's too late. <clears throat> so let's, let's try to minimize that, you know, by being, you know, and, and the, where I'm getting this is the fact that your reputation or w the way you behave yourself, your testimony does not go unnoticed. And not just by people on earth, by the Lord himself. The Lord takes notice of these things. I mean, these guys are written down in the pages of Scripture, for better or worse. Their testimony is recorded. And what that shows us is that God notices these things. God notices our behavior. He notices our, the things that we do. He notices our works, whether we're doing them or whether we're not. And he says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for every... For the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since the world, since there was a nation, even to that time, that's at that same to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one shall be found that is written in the book in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now, he's saying, look, there's going to be some people that come, that when they, when they come to the resurrection, you know, and, and they, they're going to shine as, as the brightness of the firmament. But it doesn't say we're all going to shine like that, right? And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for never. But those that do not turn many from, from unrighteousness, from, uh, that those that have not turned many to righteousness, they're not going to shine. You know, that's not, and that's not how we want to live our life. We don't want to live our life just we got our our, pick, our, our you know, our, our uh, ticket to, to heaven is stamped. We got it punched. We're on our way. We know that. We have the promise of life. But is that where we're, that's where we're going to call it quits in the Christian life? Just being saved? You know, you're going to get to heaven. You're going to realize, man, you could have had so much more. And you're gonna, you're gonna, some are going to raise to everlasting, uh, <coughs> you know, some that shall be raised to everlasting uh, life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Some are going to shine as the brightness of the stars and some of us are just going to be
you know, an Italian, what are those little, you remember the little bulbs, the Italian bulbs? Why do they call them Italian bulbs? Because they're dim? Oh man, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> right. I had a friend, his dad was Italian, I always picked on him, but you know the little, the little ones they'd have at like the, uh, the, the marquee lights, they're just, they're not very bright, so you can look and see what's being written and stuff like that. That's going to be some of us in heaven. I hope none of us in this room, but there are going to be people like that. That we get there, and there's going to be somebody else over there, just, you can't even look at them. They're just shining like the firmament, like the stars forever. And there's going to be other people, they're in heaven. But that, and that's going to be a reminder to people all throughout all of eternity what they could have had. Oh, it could have been me. And where is that determined? Here. When is that determined? Now. So that's why, you know, <coughs> we ought to take heed to the things that Paul wrote to Timothy. To not be ashamed. To hold fast, fast the form of sound words. To keep these things by the Holy Ghost and to continue to stir up the gift. You know, Paul was telling him to stir up the gift of preaching, but we all have a gift that is in us to preach as well, to turn many to righteousness. Now, there's not one person in this room, if you're saved and born again and have the Holy Ghost, and you can't go out and be a person who goes out and turns many to righteousness. That's the greatest endeavor you could work in it in life. Amen. You know, raising up a godly soul winner. You know, if you're a mother, you know, maybe you don't have as much opportunity. You're busy raising the kids. Well, probably you're raising the kids that you have to go out and do that work. You know, or those of us that have the ability to go out and, and preach the gospel, are we taking advantage of it? You know? And I know I'm preaching the choir, we got faithful soul winners down here. I, I thank God for it. Let's continue on in that. You know, let's keep going in that direction so that when we get to heaven, you know, we can we can it can be a day of rejoicing for you, for me, for our pastor, for everybody. Let's go ahead and pray.